Weaveworld is a 1987 dark fantasy novel by Clive Barker. It is about a magical world that is hidden inside a tapestry, known as the Fugue, to safeguard it from both inquisitive humans and hostile supernatural foes. Two normal people become embroiled in the fate of the Fugue, attempting to save it from those who seek to destroy it. The book was nominated in 1988 for the World Fantasy Award for Best Novel. Topic: <inaudible> 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 Plot Summary. Decades prior to the book's opening, a magical race known as the Seerkind combined all of their powers to create a secret world known as the Fugue a carpet into which they wove their most beloved locations, animals, possessions and themselves as a safe haven. Their aim was to avoid persecution by humans who call them demons and fairies and eradication by a destructive being known as the Scourge. This creature's nature is entirely unknown to the Seerkind, as no one has survived to describe it. The fugue, resembling an ordinary, albeit exquisitely woven, carpet is left in the care of a normal woman, Mimi Lashensky, who married one of the Seerkind and resides in Liverpool, England. Mimi reaches old age and is hospitalized following a stroke. A young man named Calhoun Mooney, chasing an escaped homing pigeon, accidentally glimpses the fugue hidden in the carpet, which profoundly affects him. Simultaneously, Mimi's granddaughter Susanna Parrish, arrives in the city at Mimi's behest. The mystery surrounding Mimi and the full potential of the carpet brings Cal and Susanna together and quickly into confrontation with the primary antagonists, Imakalada, an exiled and extremely powerful Seerkind bent on revenge, Shadwell, a human salesman with limitless ambition, and Hobart, a conscientious policeman. Cal and Susanna acquire new allies and abilities in their goal of protecting the fugue from destruction, venturing into it themselves twice. When Shadwell's actions result in the fugue's seemingly total obliteration, the surviving Seerkind scatter. In a last desperate attempt to finish them, Shadwell locates and awakens the Scourge, which begins systematically destroying any and all traces of magic it can find. Cal, Susanna and their remaining allies make a final stand against Shadwell by using his own tactics against him and convince the Scourge to abandon its cause and leave the planet in peace. In the aftermath, a severely traumatized Cal is cared for by Susanna whilst their friends adjust to permanent life amongst humanity. Eventually, Cal emerges from his withdrawal with the knowledge of how the fugue is still alive and can be restored to its full glory. Topic: <laughs> Characters Calhoun Cal Mooney, a bored young man whose unremarkable life takes on a dramatic turn when he witnesses the fugue. Immediately captivated, Cal attempts to simply observe the beauty of the fugue once again but in doing so becomes embroiled in Immaculata and Shadwell's plot to destroy it. His salvation comes in the form of Susanna as well as the Fugue's inhabitants who collectively encourage him to fight for it. Part of Cal's character development is a rite of passage less so of a boy to a man or even the reverse, but of a person self-actualizing. His progression is charted through his recollections and imaginings of his grandfather, a poet dubbed Mad Mooney. Through Cal's contact with the Seerkind he gradually inherits the identity of Mad Mooney himself. Susanna Parrish, a young woman who pays a visit to her dying grandmother, Mimi Lashensky and is given clues to her family's secret past. Susanna carries both Seerkind and Cuckoo blood in her veins. After accidentally obtaining the menstruum. 
by an attack from Immaculata, she becomes almost as powerful and develops a complicated kinship with her as the story progresses. Susanna is a sculptor, potter and a self-described pragmatist, initially hesitant to comprehend the bizarre situations she comes to find herself in she adapts quickly and learns to rely more on her instincts and less on her cuckoo thinking. The object of Cal's affections from the onset, Susanna politely rejects his advances believing their friendship is based more upon trust and the shared experience of the fugue rather than romantic intimacy, instead she forms a relationship with Jerichow up until his demise. At the novel's conclusion it is hinted that she has developed feelings for Cal. Immaculata, a cold, ruthless sorceress, who was exiled by her own race for practicing evil magic and desiring too much power. Already exceptionally gifted by the standards of the Sirkine, Immaculata is also a possessor, avatar of the menstruum, a subtle, powerful and seemingly sentient form of magic that manifests only in women and differently with each individual, where Susanna's is described as a heavenly silver light Immaculata's takes the form of her own weaponized blood. Introduced as the main villain of the first half of the book she has many aspects associated with the wicked witch trope such as avoiding sunlight and a predilection for surrounding herself with bones, body parts. Unlike her ally Shadwell, Immaculata acts out of revenge with no desire for personal gain. In achieving her goal she unwittingly brings about her own undoing when Shadwell betrays, humiliates and kills her. Shadwell, a charismatic, middle-aged salesman. Little is revealed of his origins or even his full name, he is simply an ordinary-looking salesman and through years of experience has honed his trade to an art. Shadwell can persuade, charm and intimidate any prospective buyer through his own talent and through the use of a gift given by Immaculata, a jacket with enchanted lining in which viewers see whatever their heart most desires. At an unspecified time prior to the book's opening he was approached by Immaculata to be her ally in unmaking the fugue, the existence of which he seemingly accepted with ease. He initially accepts her mission as an exciting challenge, the ultimate sale, with both knowing that the selling of something so powerful into any inexperienced hands would result in disaster for both buyer and goods, as is Immaculata's plan. The Scourge, a catastrophic, ancient power of unknown origin that was present at the first emergence, evolution of the Sirkind. When they left their mutual garden home it reacted to their abandonment violently and slew them by the hundreds if not thousands. When its quarry vanished from sight into the rug, the scourge returned to their ancestral garden to stand guard over the rest of time. In its lonely watch the scourge slowly succumbed to madness forgetting itself, its duty and the Sirkind as well although Immaculata given her great power could still sense its dormancy and inevitable reawakening much to her terror. Secluded in time, when its garden which is situated in a vast desert wasteland is discovered by human explorers it learns from them the story of Genesis and after killing them takes its home for the Garden of Eden and sees itself as an avenging angel, Uriel. Physically the scourge when not controlling a human host is described as indefinite and full of paradoxes, genderless and at once dark and bleached, towering and infinitesimal and always surrounded by a smothering fog. Its only physical qualities, if any are innumerable eyes that rotate seemingly on wheels of fire throughout its shapeless form, indeed Barker attributes the scourge to a being of geometries and fire rather than a corporeal entity. The hag, one of Immaculata's triplet sisters, whom she strangled while all three were in the womb. The hag survived as the ghostly presence of a gruesome old woman, always accompanying her sisters and helping when necessary. 
She can divine knowledge by examining the afterbirth produced by her prolific and likewise ghostly sister. The hag is permanently killed by her sister's progeny when Shadwell gains control of them. The Magdalene, Immaculata's other triplet sister who also survives after her prenatal death as ectoplasm. She frequently rapes defenseless men and gives birth to brutally deformed abominations called by blows within hours of their conception. Hobart, a British police inspector with unwavering dedication to the law, Hobart is contemptuous of civilians and criminals alike, believing everyone is guilty of something. Practical and narrow-minded to a fault, when first confronted with the after-effects of magic he deduces they are the result of unknown terrorist actions. When Susanna and Jerichow accidentally incite a riot in downtown Liverpool he becomes convinced they are criminal masterminds and from there onwards become Susanna's personal nemesis leading a nationwide manhunt for her. The Rake, a hideous phantasm of a former sorcerer named Domville who tested Immaculata by becoming a necromancer in an attempt to seduce her, believing himself to be more powerful than her. The attempt failed when he brought forth the surgeons although it is never confirmed, it is heavily implied that these were the Cenobites from Barker's earlier work The Hellbound Heart and its subsequent film adaptation Hellraiser, who proceeded to fillet him. He is resurrected by Immaculata as a terrifying boneless demon and sent to assassinate the Searkind which he does, claiming the life of Lilia before being destroyed by a passing train after being lured onto the tracks by Cal and Nimrod. Jerichau St. Louis, one of the Searkind who is among the first five to be unleashed from the rug. He later becomes Susanna's friend and companion, choosing not to return to the weave. Nimrod, another one of the first five Sirkind to be unleashed from the carpet after Cal tears off a piece of it. He is a shape-shifter, initially trapped in the form of the infant which he used to escape from a jilted husband whose wife he had seduced. Mimi Lashensky, Susanna's grandmother, the guardian of the rug. At the time Immaculata tracks her down, she is too old and weak to use an effective magical trick and willingly dies to prevent herself from disclosing any secrets, under Immaculata's pressure. Romo, a seerkind lion tamer and husband of Mimi. During an encounter with Immaculata, his lions grievously wound her in revenge for Mimi's death at the hands of the dark sorceress. Bomb de Bono, a Sirkind rope dancer. He becomes friends with Cal during Calhoun's first visit to the fugue, and later warns him and Susanna of the approaching scourge following a failed attempt to invoke the old science to combat it. Lemuel Lowe, owns an orchard of enchanted fruit, giddy fruit in the fugue, which is later burned to the ground by Hobart's invading forces. Topic: <coughs> <coughs> Critical reception. Reviewing Weave World in the Toronto Star, Henry Mietkovich stated. Barker proves to be far more accomplished and self-assured than in any of his previous work. Weaveworld depends upon a relatively intricate narrative structure and a host of finely crafted characters. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Comic book adaptation. Weaveworld was made into a three-issue comic series in 1991 by Epic Comics. The series were written by Eric Saltzgaber and penciled by Mike Manley. Clive Barker served as consultant. <laughs> <laughs> Miniseries adaptation 
novelist and screenwriter Michael Marshall Smith completed a first draft of a script for an eight-hour miniseries in 1995. Smith was later asked to write a complete script, but the project has fallen into hiatus and he is no longer involved. In 2001, Barker stated in an interview that a Showtime six-hour miniseries was about to enter a two-year pre-production stage, directed by queer as folk director Russell Mulcahy, probably shot in Australia. Barker announced that shooting was slated to start in 2003, with Stephen Moulton as the screenwriter. In 2005, Barker stated that, "Finally, finally, finally." The book had been adapted into a miniseries. In 2006, Barker again claimed that the miniseries adaptation was about to enter production. In September 2015, CW Network announced that Weaveworld will be adapted into a series to be written and produced by Warehouse 13's Jack Kenny and produced by Clive Barker. <laughs> 